Welcome to the Exploring Unschooling podcast. For countless parents, the journey to unschooling has redefined childhood and transformed their family relationships. Are you curious? Together, let's explore what living and learning looks like without school. Hello, explorers. I'm Pam Larickia, and it's the 13th of July, 2022, as I record this intro. And this week, we're flashing back to episode 90, Growing Up Unschooling with Phoebe Wall. I'm really excited to share this popular episode with you. Phoebe is an artist whose beautiful work focuses on the themes of comfort, nostalgia, and intimacy. After first grade, Phoebe left school and dove into unschooling. And then in 2013, she graduated from Rhode Island School of Design with a BFA in illustration and is currently working as an artist in Washington State. We talked about her passion for drawing, the idea of knowledge gaps, what she found valuable in her college experience, how unschooling has influenced her art, and her advice for unschooling parents. It was so fun to revisit Phoebe's journey. And I think this episode resonated with a lot of listeners because Phoebe shared gems of insight like this one. Unschooling feels like it was training for my adult life. You learn how to be alone and you learn how to cooperate with others and how to structure your own time and how to motivate yourself and how to sit with the discontent of not feeling motivated and not feeling inspired and how to stay curious and engaged. Through her words, you can just feel the ups and downs of real life that unschooling gives us the space to experience and move through at our own pace. Normalizing the twists and turns and challenges of life, not as something wrong or bad, but as parts of the rich tapestry of living where we can learn more about ourselves in the process of moving through them. Which is, as Phoebe says, wonderful training for adult life. And I think that is one of the biggest gifts of unschooling, time to explore and develop a deeper understanding of ourselves, which will serve our kids and us well for many years to come. I hope you enjoy our conversation. But before we dive in, I want to take a moment to thank everyone who has chosen to support the podcast through Patreon. I deeply appreciate all my patrons. Your generous support is instrumental in keeping the podcast archive freely available to anyone who's curious and wants to explore the fascinating world of unschooling. If you'd like to join my community of patrons and scoop up some great rewards along the way, check out the Exploring Unschooling page at patreon.com. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash exploring unschooling. And now let's listen in to my conversation with Phoebe. Hi everyone, I'm Pam Larickia from livingjoyfully.ca and today I'm here with Phoebe Wall. Hi Phoebe. Hi. Hello. Just to give everyone a little bit of an intro, Phoebe is an artist and her work focuses on themes of comfort, nostalgia and intimacy with nature and one another. Phoebe grew up unschooling and chose to go to college, graduating from Rhode Island School of Design in 2013 with a BFA in illustration. She's been a regular contributor to Taproot Magazine, and her first children's book, Sonia's Chickens, received the Ezra Jack Keats Book Award for New Illustrator, as well as being on various Best Children's Books of 2015 lists. Her next book, Backyard <laughs> Fairies, is coming out next spring. Yay! Yep. <laughs> I'm very excited to chat with you about your experience growing up unschooling. So to get us started, yeah. can, you, can you share with us a bit about you and your family? Yeah. um, So I live in Bellingham, Washington, uh, which is kind of like the northern, like northwestern most city uh, in Washington state. Um, So it's right up by the Canadian border. And um, I grew up here with my sister and our parents. And um, both my parents are like avid outdoors people and environmentalists. And so we grew up doing a lot of camping and hiking and playing outside and yeah, um, it's a great place to grow up, and I'm really happy to be living back here and um, to have spent an unschooled childhood here, too. <laughs> oh, I'm excited to get into that a little bit. Uh, what did your family's move to unschooling look like? Um, I was in kindergarten, and my sister was in fourth grade. 
Um, and she was having like a little bit of a hard time in school. She was a little bit of a late reader, you know, late, obviously in quotations. Um, <laughs> and she was having a hard time in school and, um, I was just not having school at all. So I'd only just started and pretty much right away I came home and told my mom that there just wasn't enough time to draw. <laughs> um, and, uh, my mom knew about John Holt and the unschooling movement from a neighbor who had older kids who were early unschoolers. So kind of on the cusp of the trend. Um, and so she started like digging a little bit deeper into it and doing some research. And halfway through that year, I started going part-time to kindergarten. And, um, then the next year we stopped going to school altogether Um, so it kind of was just like a growing discontent, I think with both my sister and I, and my mom said that she saw like a thirst for living, um, or learning, (laughs) living is learning, obviously, I guess, (laughs) but, um, living and learning, you know, kind of like disappear, like a spark go out. And, um, we were just less and less excited about school and about learning both inside and outside of school. And that really bummed her out. So she started just kind of looking for other options and, um, the first year was like a transition year. And so I went to first grade, like part-time at a little, like a uh, hippie cooperative school, private school, and then stayed home half the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and then after that second grade on, it was full unschooling for me. And my sister had a little bit of a different journey. She went, ended up going to high school full time, but I was technically unschooled throughout. Well, that's very cool. And so interesting that your your older sister was in fourth grade, too, when it kind of came to a head, because that's uh, the grade that my son was in, too. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. 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 I, it was when, and because I hadn't heard of homeschooling until that point, but it was, again, you know, he wasn't um, getting along well with the environment, right? Mm-hmm. And yeah. uh, And it was in my research that I finally came across the word homeschooling, so I Lovely yeah. that, that uh, your mom had a neighbor. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that was huge, just having someone who had the language, because mm-hmm. I think a lot of, you know, learning about a new way of doing things is just when someone says a word and then you're like, oh, wait a second, that's the word for it. That's what I want to do, you know, and so I think that was really helpful. And, you know, my mom still lives across the street from those neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> so we had our little unschooling pod. I mean, their kids were uh, well grown up by the time we were doing it. But, um, I think she was like a huge support person for my mom having done it before. Oh yeah. That's awesome. Cause it, it's true though. Cause once I'd heard it and started, um, you know, just following the little connections, right. This, 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 mm-hmm. it just, it just made so much sense. It's like, Whoa, why did I not know about yeah. any of this? It's like, of course, of course, of course, you know? Yeah, that's totally. <laughs> So I was wondering how your passion for drawing developed and if you could share a bit about how that journey unfolded for you. Um, yeah, I, I don't really know like when it began. Mm -hmm. Um, cause it kind of has just always been a thing. Um, I know that I've been doing it for as long as I can remember. And for as long as I can remember, I knew that I wanted to be an artist, um, in some form or another, you know, I was saying that when I was four or five years old and then that kind of just continued (laughs) and became true. Um, and you know, before I started school and once I returned home to homeschool, I would spend, you know, up to like eight hours a day drawing. Mm -hmm. Um, and it wasn't every day that I spent that many hours, but I always spent, a significant amount of hours in a day drawing. I would wake up before the rest of my family and kind of like patter downstairs and get going. Um, so a day like rarely passed where I wasn't doing that for a few hours. Um, and I don't really know like where the discipline came from. I think that's an, an interesting thing. I think with any kind of like passion that develops in kids, cause my parents never pressured me. They never said like, you should work really hard on this. Um, they just kind of saw me gravitating towards it and like, let me go deep. Um, and I think kind of like, that's the huge gift that unschooling gave me is that it really became a tool that allowed me to focus like so intently on the thing I was passionate about. Um, it gave me time and it fostered a sense of trust in myself and, what I wanted to do with my time because I was the one choosing to draw. I was the one choosing to make art and it never felt like a hobby to me. It felt like my work and like unschooling allowed me to keep working. Yeah. Cause you know, just even, you know, um, 
kids who have a passion like that, it, but when you get sucked into the school environment, it's so much like parents worry so much about um, their kid not experiencing all sorts of different things, right? That mm -hmm. just like subject, there's so many different subjects in school, you need experience in all these different areas. And they worry mm -hmm. so much when somebody when a child is focused on one thing that they're missing out on so much. Yeah, right. But with from an unschooling perspective, when you're looking and seeing them diving into that passion, that passion brings up so many things, right? It, it's like you almost yeah. have a window to the world through yeah, whatever your passion is. It takes you all over the place, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. Because I think what it did for me is that it gave me a context. So it mm -hmm. gave me a context in which to um, learn everything else that I needed and wanted to learn around that. And, and, you know, it's not that I didn't, I did other things. I played outside. I, you know, like played yeah. with all kinds of oh, toys. Yeah. We did science, <laughs> you know, but, um, but like, I think drawing being, um, the main focus of my life, it, yeah, it gave me an incredible focus because then it's kind of about like, well, learning about history is also part of drawing because I was really into drawing, you know, like historical costumes and I would do massive amounts of, historical research and then draw the things I was reading about. Like I would always draw the things I was reading about, you know, whether my mom was reading us uh, fiction or nonfiction. And, um, you know, like I would definitely find ways to incorporate, you know, like art into different science projects we were doing and, um, and even math, which, um, definitely, you know, I think would be considered like my most like traditional gap in my knowledge, you know, mm -hmm. like, um, eventually I figured out what I needed to know as, um, an artist, as a self-employed artist. Like I know enough math to do what I need to do. And I think unschooling also gave me the understanding that if I ever need to know more, then you learn it because it's not learning. Isn't something that kind of like stops and starts, um, only in certain times of your life and only in certain places. Yeah, that leads nicely into my next question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because uh, I want to talk a little bit of that because that is one of the common worries when people first learn about unschooling, right? Well, if you're not going to uh, follow a curriculum, how do you know they're going to learn everything they're supposed to know, right? Yeah. Um, so you talked a little bit there about uh, about how, how we – see gaps um how yeah. how really that everybody has gaps right yeah uh, so I was wondering for you to talk a little bit more about that because the really how you define gaps is is really only in the context of defining uh curricula right yeah yeah I think you're totally right um you know to talk about gaps is to box yourself into a certain way of thinking about learning um because I definitely have gaps in my knowledge but like you said I don't know anyone who doesn't mm -hmm. um I resisted doing math pretty much my whole childhood. I had a lot of anxiety about it. I still have some amount of anxiety about it. Um, I built it up as this thing I was terrible at. And so I avoided even trying to do it. And I put up a wall. But, you know, later on when I was in high school, because I went to high school part time, um, I decided on my own to take a math class. And I was like in the bottom tier. I was kind of embarrassed um, to be so far below my peers. But the drive was all my own. And so for the first time in my life, I was actually open to learning it. Um, mm -hmm. And it's interesting now, because I think a lot of my friends at the time who were in, you know, AP calculus, unless those people are in like a math or science field now, I honestly think probably our skill level has probably evened out. Like, I kind of doubt that those people ended up retaining like yeah. massive amounts of information. Like, like maybe they would like be able to pick it up quicker than I would or something, but I don't know. I, I guess I feel like that's a gap for me, but also I don't necessarily think I'm that much worse off than anyone else who had to suffer through learning lots of things that were not applicable to their lives. And instead I was doing a lot of other things that were applicable to my life and spending a lot of hours, um, honing a lot of other skills. And then, also kind of developing that understanding um, that, you know, if you trust yourself, if you build up this confidence, you can learn anything, anytime, you know, upon demand. And it's all kind of based on like the context of like, why do I need to know this thing? And because I think I'm a very hands on learner. And so once something becomes concrete of like, I have to measure this piece of paper, because I am going to make it into a book, you know, mm -hmm. or I have to balance my books, because I run my own business, like, um, 
I am much more motivated to learn how to do things, you know, when they have a context. Yeah. I think that's one of the the biggest things for me. And it's something that I just kept learning um, more deeply each time. Like I thought, yeah, sure. Lifelong learning, you know, but yeah. Uh, you know, as my kids got older and, and as I thought about it more and, and just observed myself and my own learning, right. Yeah. I, I came to realize, you know, you truly have a lifetime to learn whatever. Yeah. It really doesn't matter at what age you learn yeah. things. It, it is so much more, um, useful when it's meaningful to you. Right. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah. 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 And I think my, I think my mom also, and both my parents really, really, um, kind of like nourished that idea too, because I, I remember observing my mom doing a lot of learning with us, you know, cause mm -hmm. she was never in a traditional teacher role. Um, but I remember, you know, especially around math, like I think in her attempts to get us excited about doing math, like she actually kind of went back and like learned a lot of math stuff that she'd forgotten or that she'd kind of been anxious about in her childhood mm -hmm. and never sat down and learned. And like, so it's interesting. Cause I think like, even though, you know, maybe she quote unquote, like failed, you know, from like a systemic standard of like teaching us that when we were a kid, like <laughs> she also went back and had this amazing experience of like relearning these things in an attempt to try and get us interested in it. And like, my parents were always very, um, active in that way with our learning. Like they were very interested in asking questions of us and asking questions that they didn't know the answer to that we were all going to figure out together. And I think that's kind of a huge part of unschooling too, is like to, you know, to remove the teaching role is to kind of like become humble and say like, well, I don't know everything either. Like let's learn about all this stuff together. Oh, I love that. Cause that is a huge point. Like being modeling, being a lifelong learner yourself, right? Yeah. It's not yeah. about, oh, we're not going to do any of that stuff and, mm -hmm. and almost disconnecting, right? No, it's about diving into life with even more excitement and energy. My yeah. monitor just started shaking because I'm going, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's totally true. And I think my parents did a really good job of modeling that kind of like curiosity and zest for life. Mm -hmm. Um, because that's what's going to keep kids interested and engaged is to see adults being interested and engaged. Did you notice, like, I know, um, you know, when my kids got older and are out and about in the world and, and even, even going just to, um, unschooling conferences or gatherings where there were older unschooled teens there, that zest for life is so beautiful, right? And it's something that, um, I find unschooled kids keep, for a lot longer. I don't know, maybe they don't get so dated or maybe because they're not feeling, you know, like they've failed or been, you know, controlled so much. But it's always so beautiful to see just that joy for life maybe is the right yeah. word. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I don't know a lot of other unschoolers, actually, because oh, there yeah. was quite a few um, homeschoolers in the community we grew up in. But mm -hmm. Um, definitely. I think unschooling really is hitting the West coast, like a lot slower than it hit the East coast. Cause I know that when I went to college on the East coast, I met a lot of people in like the Boston area, which is where it like mm -hmm. kind of got going, um, who were totally familiar with the term, but a lot of the homeschoolers around where I lived, who we peripherally knew through the community were much more kind of like rigid curricula based. Like a lot of them are pretty religious. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, yeah, I, I would say that definitely the unschoolers that I have met do kind of display those traits, but I don't have that many other <laughs> um, like unschooling role models. And, and I don't know, I think maybe one of the things too, is that um, I do feel like it gives you a sense of like your life is in your hands because you're given yeah. a lot of agency as mm -hmm. an unschooler, at least I was. And um, I think that there's something that self-motivation does to kids that like gets them super excited and engaged in things that, um, in a way that it's like kind of impossible to be externally motivated that way, you know? And so mm -hmm. I guess maybe like, I think that's what it is for me is that like everything, every educational step I took was a choice, you know, which is like an enormous privilege that that was able to be a choice for me. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I, I tried going back to fifth grade because I've always been really social and I loved hanging out with kids my age. And so my mom was like, sure, try going to school. Like that's totally fine. And I tried it and 
I lasted about a week and was like, nope, still not enough time to draw. Like, I don't, you know, it's like the sum, once the, the first week of school summer camp vibe kind of faded away, I was totally over it. And, you know, so that was my choice. And so the, the way I was spending my time and the way I was kind of choosing to manage my time and educate myself was always in my hands. And I do think that that helps a lot with, um, passion for life and, you know, agency in your own life is to say like, I am here. Like I got myself here. Like I'm excited about what I'm doing. And, you know, it's, it's very intentional. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, I love the word agency, but in making your own choices, right? I mean, of course Mm -hmm. your parents and, and they're there to help and support you, whatever choices you make, but to know that you have control of your life and you're making these choices. I think what goes hand in hand with that is, is a development of such a level of self-awareness, right? Because Mm -hmm. you're making the choices and you're seeing how they play out. Mm -hmm. And that just that feedback loop, it's like, Oh, that worked for me. That didn't work for me. I'm going to tweak it this way. I mean, you learn, whereas when kids are always told what they're supposed to do, they're learning everybody else around them, right? Mm -hmm. What, what their requirements are. They're not learning as much about themselves and how they operate, I think. Yeah, totally. Um, there was one other thing that I wanted to bring out because I thought it was such a great point you made when you were talking about all the other things that um, you were learning. Uh, when people worry about gaps, you know, they, oh, you don't know this or they don't know that or maybe they won't know that. But it's not like the unschooling child is is sitting off in the corner when they're not yeah. learning that, right? Just because yeah. it's not in the curriculum, it doesn't mean it's not valuable experience in learning. They're learning yeah. so many things. It's just not in that box, right? Uh, totally. And and I think also it goes um, really hand in hand with kind of society's views. I know in my case specifically, let's say like society's views on art in general, where like it's kind of seen as this waste of time. It's seen as like a joke major and like a fluff thing and mm-hmm. like a silly, like, you know, kind of like a hobby way to spend your time. Um, but you know, like if you, yeah, like I, I wasn't just like twiddling my thumbs when I was spending all those hours drawing, like you, you're doing lots of complex kind of math and engineering subconsciously in your brain mm-hmm. when you're drawing in perspective and when you're learning different ways of drawing and, you know, like thinking about all the art history I studied, um, in relation to drawing, like there's massive amounts of knowledge and kind of like, uh, I think subconscious, um, stuff that goes into art and, um, and lots of like really wonderful, just like obviously creative flow and play and all that too, that is equally as important. And yeah, so it's kind of funny being like, Oh, there's going to be gaps. Like your kids just like spending all this time playing or they're spending all this time drawing. And you know, that is valuable. Like play is valuable um, art is valuable. It's not like the world doesn't revolve around math and science. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's so true. And that's one of the things I, I just love watching my kids over, you know, it's over time too, right? Because the, all that time to, to focus on your art, but like you were saying, all those different things that come into it and, and make connections and to Mm -hmm. see over time, um, how that develops is just, just beautiful. My daughter's a a photographer and, Mm -hmm. you know, exactly like a million things go into, um, just pursuing and and approaching that particular art, right. You know, yeah. All that stuff, you know, from history to, you, you know, all the, well, I mean, there's even the math and in all the numbers, but, and, and in patterns, like I find mm-hmm. the connections, the, the time that the kids have to think and dive in and just to ponder things, all the yeah. interesting, creative connections that are expressed through their work. Like sometimes you'll see a, a picture and I'm sure, you know, even looking at, at your art, right? Because I really enjoy, people will go check out your website, I'm sure. I <laughs> love your art and my daughter's photography and even, you know, watching my son um, in, he's in karate and, and stunt work now and stuff. You see um, the progression as, yeah. as they reach uh, a depth and you just see ideas kind of coming out in them. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And it's so rare that, and it's so rare that in any other setting, kids are given that much time to, or adults, you know, are given that much time to like really go deeply into something. Mm -hmm. Um, because you know, I, my partner has a son and he goes to public school and, um, it's, you know, it's just like, boom, 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 like the day's over before you know it. And they do all Mm -hmm. these different things. And then there's Jesus and then there's lunch and then you're home and then it's bedtime. And then, you know, like it, and it kind of blows my mind that, um, I was able to just take an entire day to choose what I wanted to do as a kid, you know, because I think that there's just not a lot of importance placed on that. I think in the current system of kind of like sitting with something that you feel is important and like just diving into it at first. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea, um, that, that much time would be valuable. You know what I mean? Like Mm -hmm. if, you know, I, the, the kids came home and, um, you know, we, I kind of thought we'd be doing this, then this, then this. And, you know, I knew I wasn't going to rush them or push or anything, but you know, when we had the freedom to take the time that we wanted to just be, to just be, yeah. I didn't realize how much it was like a sponge. It's like, oh my gosh, look at all this time that I have just to be myself and just, you know, even if it's yeah. just swinging or walking or drawing or taking pictures yeah. or whatever, it, 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 there was so much more than I expected. I think that's for me, that's been one of the most valuable things with unschooling is just the time to, to be mm-hmm. and, and it just explore yourself. And the things that you enjoy. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I, I should probably move on. <laughs> <laughs> As you mentioned, you chose to, uh, you took some classes in high school and then you went yeah. to college, Rhode Island yep. School of Design. And a lot of people are curious about college and unschooling kids to college. And I was wondering what you found valuable about that experience. Yeah. Um, I mean, to me, the fact that I was, like totally surrounded by a community which took art really seriously uh, was incredibly valuable. Um, You know, not that I hadn't been taken seriously my whole life, because obviously my parents, um, you know, had an understanding of how important it was to me. But um, there's something about being a part of an institution that's deeply invested in challenging students to create better and better work uh, that's really magical. Um, And I think part of that's because my entire art experience before college had been self-guided, that it was challenging and also really amazing to step into an environment where other people were holding a bar for me rather than holding it for myself. Um, And I think the fact that I was used to holding it for myself really helped me because like I was talking about earlier, you know, the choice to be there. I was there because I wanted to be. I was working hard because I wanted to work hard. And then Mm -hmm it helps to be in an environment where you're surrounded by people you have a massive amount of respect for and where the bar is incredibly high because you're going to be challenged. Your work is going to be critiqued and that's going to lead to a lot of growth. Um, and you know, I, I, I chose to go to college, um, to improve my work and to grow and to just go even deeper. Um, you know, I didn't go cause I felt like it was some kind of obligation or, you know, like college is what you do after you've been in <laughs> like, Mm -hmm. I, cause I'd never been on that track. I, in a way, I kind of feel like my entire childhood was training for art school and then adulthood as an artist. (laughs) (laughs) Um, but yeah, I think, um, it provided me with a lot of resources, like a lot of resources, um, cause it just expanded my worldview massively. You know, I think especially to leave home and go so far away, you know, from go from going to like the northwestern most point of the U.S. pretty much and then going <laughs> all the way over to Rhode Island to be on the completely other uh, side of the country on a different ocean. Um, you know, uh, it expanded my worldview like literally and I think just figuratively being a part of a massive art community and, you know, going to New York and going to museums and, um, just being exposed to a ton of art and a ton of culture. Cause you know, Bellingham is, it's a pretty small city and it's a wonderful city, but I think I'm really grateful that I was able to spend some time outside of it, just being exposed to what else is out there. Mm -hmm. I love that. And, and it sounds like there's kind of two parts to it. I mean, the, you know, the, the distance and the being on your own and then the, the actual art side of it, because it sounds, I, I, I draw parallels 
or, or they seem to be there, like, um, <laughs> with, uh, finding your tribe, right. Just being immersed with people who have mm-hmm. as much love for what you're doing as you do. Yeah. Of course yeah. you had support where you were right. But to have somebody who also loves it just as deeply and as crazy yeah. as you, cause it's like a different language, isn't it? Like now you have somebody, yeah. you have people, you're surrounded by people who speak your language. Yeah. And your language is advancing and advancing all the time. Mm-hmm. And you keep wanting the new, you know, packages of language to un to unpack, you know? And yeah, I think yeah. like that was, <laughs> That was what was really exciting about kind of leaving because I think, you know, uh, being in a small city and being surrounded by the same people your whole life, you know, you, uh, you, I think your language stagnates a little bit at some point, you know, there's only a certain amount of input you're getting of like culture Mm -hmm. and what art is and also the feedback people are giving you. Um, And so I think it was massively helpful and rewarding and fulfilling to go and just like be a tiny fish, you know, in Mm -hmm. a huge pond and see, you know, the wide art community and just, yeah, be exposed to like lots of other stuff and lots of other kind of people. Yeah. I, the connection I didn't finish (laughs) because <laughs> I lost my yeah. thought. It was because uh, my daughter, she, because um, we live here rurally about an hour yeah. outside Toronto, right? So, you know, we got five acres, we got a forest. She was nice. hours and hours a day taking pictures and stuff out and around here. But she got to a point where she was really wanting that level of community. So mm-hmm. at 18, like she looked around at, at college um, uh, court programs and, and stuff. Mm-hmm. But she she decided to uh, go check out New York City. Mm-hmm. Um, and she went, she, we had made arrangements, figured it out for her to go stay there for two months. But when she got there, uh, you know, it, it the first couple of days and everything, just getting used to, you know, you're on your own now, right? In a different yeah. country for her. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, oh, my gosh, you know, she found her tribe. It was, she's, you know, you just sit around and, and you you find all these, um, this this whole entire community that you can begin to participate in. Like, like yeah. as you said, we were very supportive of her here and everything. But, you know, you, sometimes you feel you need to go and just find where this, where these communities live so that you can immerse yourself. And like you said, take your, your work and your art to just a whole new level. That's so interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and it's like, and sometimes you come back, like now I'm Mm -hmm. back in my hometown and I'm back, you know, uh, surrounded by a lot of the people and places I grew up around, but I am still just so grateful that I left and not to say that everyone should leave and that that's, Mm -hmm. you know, superior, but I think it, for me, it was key. Um, Mm -hmm. because I think also it made me realize what a sense of place I had and how much it tied into my sense of self and my art. Cause I think also once I really was done with school and, um, figuring out my next steps and had really kind of developed my artistic style and thought about the kind of work I wanted to make, I was like, I need to be making that work at home because that work Mm -hmm. is home. And I don't, I couldn't see my kids. I thought about moving to New York city. I, a lot of my friends moved there and still live there. And I, it was my plan for a long time. And then I was kind of like, I can't, I can't see it. I don't think that my work will be my best work there. I think my Mm -hmm. work will be my best work in the place where I began making work. That's so cool. And, and now you have, um, that, that network, right. Too, as well. Once you've created that network, um, for, for your work that, that, that takes another level out of it. Right. Yeah. I didn't say that very well, but, but you know what I mean? That's, that's one, one less now that you have that under your belt, that also, um, helps you feel comfortable. You you're more secure as in I can take this wherever I need to. Right. Because yeah. I, I know where I can connect, especially yeah. now, right. With, uh, all the online mm-hmm. access to people and stuff. And yeah. like, yeah, my, my daughter just, um, she really loves LA too. And mm-hmm. she just flew out there, um, for a month and she's just, posting, you know, uh, I'm, I'm out here to do bookings and stuff and she's getting work out there too. And, and 
she she loves the travel aspect as well. So it's it's all yeah. about knowing yourself, isn't it? Right? Yep. And you, yeah. you knew that's where you wanted to be right now. You know, and that's the other thing is I think a lot of I think one thing unschooling does too is allow us to we learn um that things aren't forever. These aren't forever mm-hmm. choices, right? There we're mm-hmm. our choices now and we still pay attention. We don't beat ourselves up if something changes and we change our mind and want to do something else. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Because I think it's, it's a much more fluid way of interacting with the world and mm-hmm. it's a lot less linear. And I think that that, um, in the end is how life is and how learning is. And I think it's like helped a lot in just, yeah, being an adult, like accepting things as kind of fluid and, um, yeah, like something might be right one day and it might not the next and that's okay. Yeah, exactly. Instead of beating ourselves up all the time that, oh, yeah, I, I, that's one, uh, you know, the idea of failure, right? So much, Mm -hmm. um, conventionally, you know, you have a goal, you have to stick to it. You can't quit you yeah. know, uh, don't look like you're, you know, moving back on something. Everything's seen as failures. When you change your mind, you must mm-hmm. have not decided the right thing back there if you mm-hmm. aren't going to follow through on it. Yeah. But yeah, to understand yeah. that we're just fluid and learning and growing that ties back to lifelong learning too. Right. Yeah. You know, it's all, it's all, um, just part of our, it's really part of our days unschooling is living. You said way back at the beginning. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I was wondering no, if you I... could talk a bit about, uh, sorry, were you going to say something? Oh, no, no, no. I wasn't. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to dive a little bit more into how you see, um, your unschooling childhood influencing your art. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think it's impossible to separate the two things. Um, cause they're both so ingrained in my identity that I don't really know how one would be without the other. Um, or one, if one would even exist without the other, you know? (laughs) Um, yeah. (laughs) uh, Cause like I said, I've moved back to my hometown and, uh, I find myself spending my days like really similarly to the way that I spent my days when I was an unschooled kid. Um, I wake up early and I work, um, in my illustration studio in my pajamas and I listen to audio books. Um, which is pretty much like exactly what I did uh, (laughs) my entire childhood. Uh, And to me, that feels like a really good thing. Um, I think especially because of the nature of what I do, creating things for kids, it feels right that through my daily routine and through the work I make, I'm like getting closer and closer to my kid self um, Mm -hmm. because my kid self, I think really feels like my essential self. Uh, And I don't know. I, I hope that kind of addresses the question of uh, how unschooling kind of influenced my art. Cause I just feel like they're inseparable. I think, I think it's really influenced my routine. Like I said, it unschooling feels like it um, was training for my adult life. Uh, You learn how to be alone and you learn how to cooperate with others and how to structure your own time and how to motivate yourself. Um, and how to sit with the discontent of not feeling motivated and not feeling inspired. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. and how to stay curious and engaged. Um, yeah. And I think, I don't know, it's all been huge in terms of my art. Cause I think like I, I illustrate and I create the things that I would have wanted to see and have and touch and play with when I was a kid. Um, mm-hmm. and so I think my art feels very like, inherently related to my childhood and unschooling was my childhood. So I think that they'll always be like incredibly tightly linked. Mm-hmm. I was, um, uh, your, your book, Sonia's chickens, right? I, I yeah. the, for me, there was quite a, a theme of like tr- trust in the relationship between the, the children and adults and, mm-hmm. I, it, you know, it just seemed to, um, I'm trying to think of how to put it, but, you know, be, it, it be very different than, than your typical adult child kind of relationship. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, 
yeah, I'm glad that you got that from it. I think <laughs> that's something I, I probably, you know, kind of subconsciously put into it. And I think it's because that was my experience of being parented was. That, yeah, that is just your yeah. experience of how yeah. adults and children relate to one another, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, like Sonia's dad in the book, he trusts her with a lot of heavy information, you know, about mm. like the cycle of life. And I think that's definitely how my parents talked to me as a kid. You know, they didn't dumb stuff down. They just presented it in a way that um, made sense to me or, uh, you know, or sometimes challenged me. And I think like trusting kids with information is huge, just like trusting kids with, you know, like how they want to spend their time and what they want to do with their bodies and what, you know, like what they're excited about, you know, Mm -hmm. I think it's just as important as that. Yeah. I love that. (laughs) Um, yeah. (laughs) Your work has been described as uh, body positive. In in an online interview I enjoyed, uh, you were asked to how you define that. And I really loved your answer. So I'm just going to read this little bit here. Okay. Uh, you answered, I think it is holding on to the core value that my worth does not lie in my physical features. It is being gentle and patient with myself because truly loving, sustainable relationships are a two-step forward, one-step back process. It is hard work maintaining an appreciative and honest relationship with yourself. Above all, it's about trusting myself. Sometimes I breach my own trust and have to rebuild, but then again, sometimes my own strength and beauty will impress me beyond what I thought possible. And I love that. And as I was reading it, I think that a process applies so well to just about every societal expectation we may find ourselves grappling with, like, mm-hmm. you know, not sending kids to school, the parent child relationship that we were talking about, right? Going against the, against the conventional um, mm-hmm. wisdom on that. So I was hoping you might expand a little bit on how that process plays out for you. Yeah, um, I think it has everything to do with that fluidity that we were talking about and the patience and the gentleness and the self-trust. I think those are all like, to me, very strong tenets of the way that I feel like unschooling influenced my life. And um, yeah, I think, I don't know, I, it's funny, while I I still identify with a lot of parts of the body positivity movement, um, but I also feel like lately, I think, like a body neutrality has kind of like, been really appealing to me because I think also, you know, positivity puts a lot of weight on an individual's shoulders to stand up against, you know, massive societal problems. And it can also make you feel like you're failing, like, oh, I'm not being positive enough. Like I'm not loving myself enough. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and it kind of maintains like a hyper focus on bodies at all, you know, whereas in reality, like, I think I, love my body the most when I'm not thinking about it, when I'm making something and being defined by something other than my body or when I'm camping and I just haven't looked in a mirror for a week and I don't, I couldn't like my body when my body is just a tool, when it's just like a sack that my brain and guts and muscles like are carried around (laughs) in. Um, (laughs) and I think, so I think like the gentleness part of, uh, and the patience part of body positivity has become, uh, something that I think is really important. Um, and just letting the feelings flow over you, you know, like you're allowed to be frustrated. You're allowed to feel these feelings that, um, our culture, you know, beats into you and it's not your fault. Um, you know, that all feelings are allowed. And I think it totally relates back to, uh, you know, what we were talking about with, you know, self-motivation and, uh, cause also, of course, even though I was a really self-motivated kid on schooling, I, of course, went through, you know, dry spells. And I still go through dry spells with my work where I'm just like, I have no ideas. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what path I'm on. And I think unschooling um, has influenced, you know, not only the way I feel about my body, but also the way that I work and exist in the world. And that like, I hope that it has, or I I try, you know, to like, (laughs) it's still a kind of gentleness and patience in myself that says like, it's okay to feel these feelings, like just ride it out. Like, feel these sad feelings and these frustrated feelings and these feelings of not being motivated and, um, yeah, like experience them and kiss them goodbye and like just get up tomorrow and 
work hard at something, you know, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I don't that's, know. That's kind of the, <laughs> it does. That's kind of the impression I got from like the two steps forward, one step back, because it, there's always something more to learn. Right. Yeah. Yeah, you always absolutely. bump up against and, and totally the, you know, the getting to the point of, of the ease, right? Like, I loved how you were talking about your, you know, your body as, as a tool, as a container, as, you know, um, because that's one thing I found too, you know, at first, um, when you're unschooling and you really feel like you're going against convention, right. Mm -hmm. You, you feel that energy, you feel that push. Um, and it was only, uh, a few years later, where, you know, I was just so comfortable just being out in the world with my kids. Yeah. It wasn't at all about unschooling, going to school or, or any that that conflict, that positive negative side just never just didn't bubble up as yeah. much anymore. You know, we were just out there being in the world. And if somebody asked, you know, why aren't they in school or something, you know, it was it was just a conversation. There was no um, pressure anymore. Yeah. You know what I mean? So yeah. I, I, I think that's such a great point because you, it's, it's all, I don't know if it's cliche, but it, it really is, you know, a journey and we are yeah forever always learning. So there's always a couple steps, you know, steps forward and then maybe something comes up and you're like, Hey, you know, I, yeah. I felt that I noticed that or that like you were talking about earlier, the discomfort that you sit with, right? Oh, there's mm -hmm. discomfort here from something. I'm going to have to, you know, mm -hmm. sit, wait it out, see, see if I can find the route. You know, there's your little step back or off to the side and then you move yeah. forward. It yeah, was just such and... a beautiful image, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think it's, I think it's true. I think it's great. I think, um, you know, and it goes back to that fluidity that we were talking about too. Mm -hmm. And I think yeah, the body exactly. stuff really ties into that fluidity too and the flexibility. And, um, cause I think like a lot of, you know, societal norms kind of teach us that like your body is one way and you should work to make it another. And then, you know, like mm -hmm. say like once, you know, like maybe once you lose weight and then you'll just be skinny forever. And I think also like, you know, like I've struggled with my weight my whole life. And I think like, I try, I try hard, you know, obviously I don't always succeed, but I try hard to look through it at it through that lens of flexibility and fluidity. And, um, you know, that like, sometimes my body's going to be one way and sometimes it's going to be another. And that's always, that's going to change as I age. It's going to change, you know, like depending on all these other things in my life. And, you know, it's just kind of like any other thing in life. It's not always in your control. Hmm. That's the word that was popping in my head when you were talking is, is the control piece, right? Well, yeah. where we still feel we need to um, c control external yeah. things. Yeah. yeah. I, I could just sit with that thought for <laughs> ages. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, I think that's like that the human very struggle. Well for that's like the human condition is like wanting <laughs> to have control and not having it and sitting with the frustration mm. of that, you know, dealing with the frustration of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's such a great point. Okay, last question for you. <laughs> As a grown unschooler, what piece of advice would you like to share with unschooling parents who are just starting out on this journey? Oh, man. Um, I feel like you should be asking my parents. No pressure. <laughs> I feel like I should get my mom on the line or something. Um, yeah. I don't know. Um, I think... Uh, there's a lot of fear, um, in our culture and in the system, uh, around removing kids from this thing that we rely on so heavily to kind of keep, um, keep everyone in a certain box and in a certain line and on a certain trajectory. Um, and so I guess I'd say like, don't let the system scare you into thinking your kid's going to fail if they don't do or learn things in a certain way. Um, and I think that really goes for all parents. Um, I probably scared the crap out of my mom by only drawing all the time and refusing to do other things. Um, <laughs> I was really stubborn and I hated doing things someone else's way and on someone else's schedule. And I'm sure that, you know, like made my parents' lives not that pleasant a lot of the time. Um, <laughs> but I think parents unschooling and not are really brave. Um, Cause like I said, our culture 
doesn't make it easy to feel okay about having kids who think outside the box um, and doing things that are outside of the box. And it must be really scary to trust that even if your kid is like refusing to learn math or read that um, they're going to come around to it someday and that it's all going to be okay. Like that to me, like, I'm just like, that must be so scary. Because <laughs> um, I think about that a lot, you know, like in terms of will I unschool my own kids and um, mm-hmm. thinking about my experience and I don't know, I don't know if I will. And, you know, I'll probably have to meet my kids first. Um, but it, it's always really interesting because I, it definitely, when I think about it in that context, I'm like, that must have been scary. You know, that is brave for parents to be like, no, I'm going to step outside of this institution that, you know, our culture puts so much trust in, you know, um, Mm -hmm. I think that takes a lot of courage to step outside the line. So I don't really know if it's advice, um, (laughs) but I'd say like, good job. (laughs) It's going to be okay. You're doing great. Well, the, and the fear thing, that was that was a great <laughs> point. And and you you nailed it. It is a, a level of trust. Yeah. Right? It's it's a huge level of trust. And I know, you know, when newer parents come in, that it's and it's how you define trust. It's not trust as in closing your eyes and just hoping it all works out in the end. Yeah. It's it's that trust of really paying attention. And, and watching your kids and, and, um, watching them over time for a while. And I swear so many times when as a parent, you're like, Hmm, I wouldn't do it that way. (laughs) Or, you know, maybe I, why is she just doing this all, all the time? Yeah. But you know, if you're paying attention um, you so often see, you see over time, these little, connect, Oh, look, look what she did there. I could not have imagined that. And, and you are just shocked and surprised and in awe of your children. Yeah. And, yeah. And that's where the trust starts to, to build because it's like, wow, I could have controlled them and, you know, kind of helped cool, you know, very, maybe even very nicely coerced them along my path. Yeah. You know, um, but holy crap, look at the path they took. I could never have, you know, uh, even imagined that path and taken them along there. And that's just so much better for who they are as a person yeah. than I could have envisioned for them. But yes, you, you, you need that, that trust is so helpful or else the fear is always on you. Right. Yeah. 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 That's so interesting. And I think your point was great about, you know, whether or not you choose to unschool your children, because it's not, um, it's not a requirement. It's not a failure. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, here's my situation now. Here's my life. Here's my kids. I bet my kids, you know, here's the the way things are. Mm -hmm. But I bet you, you're not, even if one of your children goes to school, you're not going to, um, be bringing that whole ethos home with you. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's lots of ways you can give kids, you know, the gift of trust um, that aren't necessarily only by unschooling. Um, Cause I think that that trust just, it's going to have positive ripple effects. And I think there's a lot of ways to bring that into kids' lives, you know, no matter what kind of mm-hmm. school uh, they go to. And give them yeah. some agency. Yeah. Right? They yeah. can definitely have. Um, you know, st- still have space to make choices and, you know, time within the constraints, but you know, the value of that time for them and, 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 you know, just from your own experience, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, I want to say thank you so, so much for taking the time to speak with me, PV. It was oh. a lot of fun. <laughs> You're so welcome. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you so much for taking the time. And before we go, where's the best place for people to connect with you and check out your art online? Yeah. Um, well, you can go to my website, which is phoebewall.com. So that's P-H-O-E-B-E-W-A-H-L.com. Um, and then I also have a shop, which is linked from my website, which is reopening tomorrow. Um, and then also my Instagram, which is at Phoebe Wall, is probably the best way to kind of stay consistently up to date with what I'm up to, whether it's, you know, what I'm cooking or what my cat's doing, you know, (laughs) but (laughs) what I'm making. (laughs) Oh, that's awesome. Thank you so much, Phoebe. Thank you so much. 
I hope you found this episode helpful on your unschooling journey. And be sure to check out the growing podcast archive. The conversations never go out of date. You can find more information about my books, the Living Joyfully Network online community, and the Childhood Redefined Unschooling Summit online course at my website, livingjoyfully.ca.